All right. Um, we'll, for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Allie Cantrell, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach with Alabama Cattlemen's Association. A small background on myself, I grew up on a commercial cow-calf operation in Texas and went on to major in animal science at Texas A&M University for my bachelor's, and then graduated from, with my master's in 2018. I'm very excited to welcome you all to the first session of the Marketing Meet Direct to Consumers webinar series. This webinar series has been organized by myself, Alex Teague with Alabama Cooperative Extension, Dr. Jason Sawyer with Auburn University, and Ellie Watson with the Alabama Department of Ag and Sweet Grown Alabama program. Our agenda today is to cover the steps and management considerations it takes to prepare your live animals for processing. Throughout this session, please keep your microphones muted and type any questions you may have into the chat box. I will be monitoring the questions as they come in, and if I feel like it is important to address the question in the moment, then I will pause the speaker to ask. If not, we will save the question for the last 15 minutes of the session. You are also always welcome to email or call any one of us after the session should you have any questions after, afterwards. Kicking off the webinar series will be Alex Teague with Alabama Cooperative Extension. He has served in many regions across the state of Alabama through the Extension Service and has gained a wealth of experience in the meat industry by cattle of his own and working in a meat processing plant. Alex is pursuing a PhD at Auburn University and has definitely served our industry from pasture to plate. I am excited to have him here with us today and with that I will turn the session over to him. Awesome. Thanks, Allie. Uh, I really appreciate the, the everybody joining us today, and, and I'm sure we'll have a few more continuing to join in as they figure the technology out. Um, like Allie said, we're, we're really excited about this three-part series and uh, kind of what we're going to get to do this week and talk about. And all these are going to be recorded, so if for some, some reason you lose connection, uh, we'll be able to get it back to you on the, uh, the, the Cattleman's website at a later time. Um, so the part we're going to start with today is is everything leading up to taking an animal to the processor all right so i think as we we kind of start to look at what's going on right now in the industry uh there's a tremendous opportunity for some some locally produced meat products right um there are a lot of consumers that are asking for local meat production that maybe have never done that before uh, between the price issues that they've run into at local grocery stores over the last two, three, four weeks, uh, potentially some shortages at, at their local market, what they're seeing on social media, who knows. But, but there's a lot of folks that are, that are interested right now in purchasing meat directly from you, the producer, that, that we've probably never seen in this space before. And so to me, this provides us a huge opportunity if we can deliver on the expectations those consumers have, okay? So everyone we're dealing with, they've ate beef before. They, they've had pork before, they've had chicken before, they've had that product before. They have a preconceived idea of what that product needs to be when it shows up at their, their doorstep. And so if we deliver a, a product that's similar in quality to what they're used to seeing, they're probably gonna be fairly happy with it. And we might can build a customer base that you can keep for years on end. Um, but at the same time, producers, or excuse me, consumers are, are typically fairly price driven. Um, and so if we don't deliver a product that meets their expectations, uh, why are they going to be willing to pay for it? And, and maybe sometimes pay more for a product that's not as good and is maybe more trouble to get when they eventually will be able to go back to their local Walmart or Publix or, or, or some other chain store and purchase meat by the cut. And so um, I think what we, to, to kind of start some of this off, we have to think a little bit about just what exactly do our consumers expect, all right? And so uh, what we're expecting is, is a safe product. Uh, obviously, if it's going through a commercial packing facility, it's going to be safe. And, and that's what Dr. Sawyer is going to spend a good bit of time talking about on Wednesday. Um, but from an eating perspective, our consumers have an expectation of, of palatability, right? They have a tenderness expectation uh, of juiciness and a flavor expectation. Some of those are different depending on the species. If we're talking about beef, and, and today we're going to spend most of the time talking about ruminant production beef. 
uh, specifically, I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, pigs and uh, and small ruminants or sheep and goats, or at least some some kind of minor notes on some of that for those of you that, that might be interested in, in doing that as well. But, you know, from species to species, it, it, those expectations are different. Our beef consumers are looking primarily for a choice product with some marbling, um, ground beef. It's got to be tender, the, the, the steaks do. Um, and uh, and flavorful most of the time if they've never had grass-fed beef they're looking for a grain-fed product or at least they're expecting the flavor of a grain-fed product versus someone that's purchasing pork uh, is probably looking more less at the flavor side of the equation and more at, at tenderness uh, and juiciness and, and, and a, a really lean product that doesn't have a lot of fat um, sausage something like that uh, and, and then our small ruminant guys the folks purchasing our lambs and, and goats that's its own totally separate world that's got a, a million little niches in it that we'll try and talk about a little bit. But, but for each one of those expectations, we have to be able to produce an animal that is truly finished. And um, since we don't have a commercial feeding industry here in Alabama, we don't finish a lot of, of red meat animals in Alabama. I think a lot of folks have lost the definition of what exactly does finished even really mean. Uh, I got a call last week talking to a producer that that was was about to get ready to sell a freezer beef to a, a customer that was uh, you know going to be a 650 pound calf just about straight off the cow. All right, there's nothing wrong with that. That calf we're going to be able to grind him up, make steaks. We're going to do some things with him, but he definitely doesn't meet the um, the criteria of a finished animal. So when we're we're talking about finished, what does that even really mean? Well, again, kind of like the species differences we see uh, from consumer expectations, finished is different depending on the species we're talking about. So for cattle, um, what you, the, the graph you see there on the right is, a, is, is what we call a, a fairly simple sigmoidal gro uh, growth curve. So the idea with that growth curve, we can apply this to, to virtually every different livestock species, but you can see time on the bottom and weight gain on the top or size. And so when an animal's fairly young, uh, even when that that animal is uh, a fetus still in in uh, in utero, uh, it may be growing very rapidly, but it's not getting very big very quickly, right? So we've got a newborn calf. He may be growing like gangbusters for the first three, four, five, six weeks of his life, and all he did was gain 25 pounds. As we get closer to puberty and through the center part of an animal's life, they're starting to lay down a lot of lean muscle, uh, growing skeleton, getting larger, and that's when we start to see a, a very rapid uh, rate of growth. And then as those animals begin to uh, approach maturity, uh, they start to grow less frame, less muscle, and lay down fat um, and, and kind of slow down a little bit and also become a little less feed efficient too when we start thinking about uh, the feed side of the equation. So for cattle, you can see that this growth curve is kind of set up for cattle. We're typically looking at finishing these animals pretty close to their finished mature weight. Uh, that weight is going to be very dependent on frame, all right? So if we're talking about some smaller framed, old school, traditional English cattle, um, you know, they may be finished at 1,050, uh, 1,100 pounds. Uh, if we're thinking more about the, the Charlotte crosses and some of the bigger framier cattle, we may have to get them as, as heavy as, as 1,500 pounds, 1,550 to really get, to get them truly finished. But that's, mature weight is not a one size fits all. Uh, if you're looking for a, a kind of good rule of thumb, look at what his mom weighs or her mom weighs. Uh, and if you're using bulls of similar frame to the cows, that can give you a pretty close estimate. You know, if she's a 1,300 pound cow and she's in good flesh, her steers are probably going to need to be about that same size, roughly. As we're approaching that finished uh, animal, we're, we're starting to see less lean tissue, muscle growth, and, and we're starting to see some fat deposition occur. And, and that's pretty key, is when we're starting to see the fat deposition occur on these, these cattle. So our target in the commercial feeding industry is, is trying to hit a half to six tenths of an inch back fat, okay? Well, how do you tell what's a half or six tenths of an inch back fat? I mean, it's, that's real easy, right? We just take a knife and cut a little spot in your skin and take a measurement, right? No, no, I mean, we can't, there's no way to really know exactly what that, that number is until after the animal's harvested. What we can do, though, is kind of look for some some indication is across the animal um, for finish. So if we start to see fat deposited around the tail head, um, on heifers, we begin to see fat deposited in the udder. 
on a steer, this would be fat deposited in what we call the cod or where the, the testicles would have been if that calf was not castrated. Um, across their top line, if they're fairly lean, you may still be able to see a little bit of a, a, a divot between the muscles of their back. And as they start to get fatter, uh, they, they'll start to smooth off there. And then definitely if you start to see a lot of fat deposition in the brisket, uh, that animal's starting to get fairly fat. Which are some things we're wanting to see as we're trying to produce a finished animal ready for harvest. But why? I mean, why is fat important? Why do we need all of that fat on the animal? Well, for our beef uh, customers, I think the, one of the biggest things they're expecting out of traditionally produced beef is flavor and juiciness and, and, and tenderness as well. But one of the things we can, we can affect uh, with nutrition is definitely the flavor of that animal. And we can provide some, some juiciness in that steak with intermuscular fat or marbling. And so the, the, the general consensus or, or, or thought that we've had for decades is that intermuscular fat is the last place that animal is going to deposit fat. Uh, it's got four fat de depots, we would call them subcutaneous fat or the fat on the outside of the animal, mesenteric fat or the fat around the internal organs, uh, intermuscular fat, which would be the fat between the muscles, and then finally intramuscular fat or that marbling, these little little flakes of marbling inside that uh, inside that ribeye muscle. Now, that's not exactly true. Uh, we can affect marbling and affect um, how much marbling that animal is going to have really throughout its entire life. Uh, there's a lot of data out there that shows that even some of the things we may be doing, feeding the, the dam uh, while she's pregnant with the calf can affect marbling deposition. So, so definitely thinking about nutrition of this animal throughout its entire life is really important. Um, but, but marbling is a, a, a twofold problem. Uh, it's definitely genetics. There's a huge genetic component of it, and it's definitely nutritionally related. All right, so we can have the the best genetic animal in the world, top one percent of the Angus breed for for marbling. But if we don't do a good job feeding it, and we don't provide a high energy feed ration, it's not going to marble. Okay, it's not going to have enough fat to lay down any amount of fat in its muscle. And the exact opposite is true as well. We can we can make a calf really really fat and provide outstanding nutrition. Um, but if he doesn't have the genetics to lay down now marbling and, and put together a, a carcass that, that's desirable, it's, it's not going to happen. Not, there's not enough feed in the world to make a calf marble that doesn't have the genetics to do so. So definitely a two-part equation we want to we chase. The other side, though, is we don't want to push that envelope too far. Okay, so the, the carcass on the left-hand side of the screen is probably fairly ideal. This would be what we call a USDA yield grade three carcass. So we're looking at half an inch of back fat. Uh, plenty of marbling in that ribeye, and so this this animal's not going to produce a lot of waste. When when uh, the butcher goes in and starts fabricating this carcass and uh, and cutting it into retail cuts, there's not going to be a whole lot that gets wasted. Versus our yield grade five or that really fatty carcass on the right hand side, you know, probably the better part of an inch of back fat. Um, yeah, it's got a lot of marbling, but we're probably looking at a lot 20, 30, 40 pounds of excess fat on the outside of this animal that we can't do much with. Okay, we can't throw it into ground beef because it would make our ground beef really, really fatty. So we're probably going to have to trim that off and um, and throw it away if we don't have any lean uh, lean protein to go with it to make, to make uh, fattier ground beef out of. As we start to think about pigs, this is a, a completely different equation. Um, for swine, we're really looking at, at two things. To, to signal that an animal is, is finished per se. One's weight. Uh, typically, the, the, in the industry, we're trying to create about a 270 to 280 pound uh, market pig is what's, what's kind of acceptable in the commercial swine industry. Uh, for backyard swine production, it's locally produced swine production, we might can get away with an animal a little smaller or bigger than that. So maybe 225 to 300 pound live weight uh, is what we're trying to target. Now, this animal's not really that close to his mature weight. When we think about what a mature boar can weigh, they can get much larger than that. Sows can get a good bit bigger than that as well. So these animals are really harvested while they're still laying down a lot of muscle and still fairly lean. Um, you know, if we were thinking about a finished pig in the 1950s, 60s, maybe the early 70s, that was a pig that probably had a lot more fat on it than today. But, but today's pig, modern, the modern genetics we're using uh, for swine production, we're probably trying to produce a pig that's you know, less than six tenths of an inch of back fat, um, 
as you, you kind of look at, at trying to, when, you, when you're looking at that animal, uh, instead of seeing a nice smooth, uh, flat top, like we're talking about with that calf, uh, he's probably still got a little bit of a ridge there where you can see a, a depression between the muscles of the back. And so we want a fairly lean animal is what our, our consumers are expecting. And then for small ruminants, the sheep and goats, um, there's really no one size fits all for small ruminants. Uh, it's, it's largely dependent on religious holidays. If you're trying to hit the Easter market or some of the spring, uh, other holidays for different, different ethnic groups, um, you may be looking at producing a whole small animal that can be roasted or barbecued as a whole animal. Uh, or if you're trying to do something like farmer's markets, local stores, restaurants, you may be trying to produce a, you know, 100, 120 pound lamb or, or weather um, that, that's going to be a little heavier, a little bit heavier muscle, fatter, that we're going to cut into chops and, and, you know, leg of lamb and that sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot of variation in what's acceptable in small ruminants. There's also probably a market in small ruminants for, for coal breeding stock a little differently than what we might see in, in, uh, in pigs and cattle, um, just because of the way those animals are sold. So. All right, from there, what we're gonna do is kind of transition into thinking about nutritional management. And so I've really broken this into two big pieces, um, kind of the, the nutritional management for beef cattle or ruminants. So most of what I'm gonna talk about in this next section, we could apply to um, sheep and goats as well. The nutrition side is gonna be fairly similar. The weights may be different, but the percentages of body weight will be about the same and the energy requirements will be about the same. And then we'll talk, a little bit about non-ruminants or, or pigs, specifically thinking about the uh, all the, the management challenges we're gonna have with those, getting them ready to go to market. All right, so when we start to think about growing beef cattle, um, we've gotta provide a lot of energy in their diet, okay? So this is some, uh, some requirements from the beef NRC nutrient uh, requirement guide. If we're, we're looking at an animal that we're trying to get at least three pound a day gain out of, so if we're trying to finish a steer, uh, put weight on a steer to start laying down fat and become truly finished, we're probably needing to target at least three pound a day average daily gains during the finishing period. Okay, so from whatever you started on this full feed ration until it reaches its, its market weight. So for younger calves, so these six, 700 pound uh, maybe weaned 30 or 45 day calves that are less than nine months old, less than 10 months old. To, to, to meet that kind of gain requirement, uh, those animals require a really high energy ration. So according to NRC, we're looking at you know 80 plus percent TDN uh, and maybe getting up there 15, 16 percent crude protein on these young animals to get them to gain the weight we want them to gain to start to lay down fat and finish. Now one of the things that we can do, especially if we're going to do a grain finished animal, is background these calves and, and kind of stalker these calves until they're closer to a true yearling. So run them on commodities or something, uh, keeping their, their gain down around two pound a day average daily gains until they get up to eight or 900 pounds. At that time, we can swap them over to a high energy feed stuff uh, and get the gain we want without having to push the, 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 the energy quite as hard. So for these eight, 900 pound yearling steers or heifers, you know, we, we, we only need really 70% TDN uh, and, and maybe 10 to 12 percent crude protein to get the gain we're looking for to get these animals to finish. All right, well that's that's all well and good. Lots of energy. What does that even mean? Well, as we start to look at some of the the pretty typical um, feeds that are available to us in Alabama, here's some kind of general rules of thumb for what these are going to look like from a, an energy and protein perspective. So TDN, for those of you that are not familiar, that's total digestible nutrients as a percentage of dry matter. So that's the total nutrients in that diet that can be turned into energy as that animal digests it. Uh, our warm season perennial grasses are fairly low in energy. Uh, even 58 to 60 percent TDN may be a little high. Uh, that, you know, they're, they're, we're not going to get real high energy out of some of those diets versus some of our cool seasons, the tall fescue, ryegrass. Um, you know, we may be up in the 60, 70 percent TDN range. As we start to look at some feedstuffs, Corn would kind of be our gold standard, no pun intended, for, uh, for energy. Uh, it's 90% TDN, it's, it's almost exclusively TDN, fairly low in protein though, and so using it in a finishing ration, we're probably gonna have to add some sort of protein supplementation with it. Uh, corn also is a starch-based feed, 
versus basically everything else on this um, on this list is a, a fiber based feed. So so corn's digested a little differently by cattle uh, than the rest of those are. So that's that's kind of important to note when we're starting to change feeds. If you're going to include a lot of corn in the ration, we probably are going to want to run that up pretty high and get up you know 60 70 percent of the diet as corn. Um, but you can see a lot of these have got enough energy to meet that 70% plus TDN requirement uh, that we're looking for in growing a yearling to finish, okay? So as we start to think about what are some production systems that, that you can utilize in finishing cattle, there are really two different avenues that you can go. Uh, either the grass-fed, grass-finished option or grain-finished. And that's this is kind of a... Uh, preference that, that your consumers have that you need to kind of understand your market, know where you're going to take these animals to, who's going to be purchasing them, and, and understand what that, that consumer is desiring. You know, a lot of consumers see grass-fed as a healthier option. It does tend to be a little leaner. Uh, it is higher in omega-3 fatty acids and, and conjugated linoleic acid, although those are probably not true real health benefits. They are differences, uh, and it's definitely got a lot different flavor than our very typical grass fit or grain finished animal that we're all used to eating that you would buy at a commercial grocery store. So the grain finished animals, you know, this is exactly what consumers are used to eating on a daily basis. Um, that, that fat's gonna be white and, and has a very different flavor than those grass fed animals. And so both of those have very different, obviously very different production systems to get them to a finished uh, product. So we'll start first with grain finishing animals. Um, we're not gonna get into great, you know, really great detail on exact diets and exactly how some of this one is gonna work, but I, I did wanna provide, because uh, if we were gonna do that, we could take a three hour seminar just on grain finishing animals and, and nutrition. There's lots of folks that get masters and, and PhDs just in understanding, you know, nutrition on beef cattle uh, to, to put together feed yard diets. So 45 minutes, we're gonna try and stay under a day. It's not enough time to get that done. But I do wanna give you some general, um, guidelines and considerations and and things that you need to be thinking about if you're wanting to grain finish some animals so first we've got to remember that this animal is a ruminant first and if you're not familiar with what that term means basically it means that animal's got a four chambered stomach all right it's a rumen reticulum omasum and abomasum and the first two chambers that rumen reticulum is basically a big fermentation vat without some amount of long stem forage roughage uh, that rumen doesn't work it doesn't ferment correctly. Uh, we have all kinds of problems, digestive problems begin to appear, uh, and we can have a lot of health-related issues if we are not able to keep at least half a percent of body weight of long stem roughage in their diet. Hay, grazing, really doesn't matter, uh, but it does need to be you know, some sort of functional roughage, um, not, not just fiber. I mean, soy holes are a great fiber source. They're not a great roughage source, okay? Now, the other side of that then is if we're gonna do grain finishing, we probably need to be pushing these animals to eat. Once we get them fully on feed, they need to be eating 2% of body weight of a constant, 2% body weight, excuse me, of a, a concentrate feed or more, okay? So we can do that one of two ways. We can either hand feed the animals or we can use a self feeder. Both of them work really well uh, as long as you're using a feed that is designed to be fed that way. Self feeders are really easy. You fill the feeder up, you pull it out in the pasture, you leave it. You go check it every couple of days. When it starts to get low, you fill it back up. Uh, key with self feeders, don't let them run out. Never let them run out. If you let that animal run out on a full feed ration like this, especially if it's got a lot of corn in it, um, we can start to see some, some ruminal issues as that animal goes off feed and then comes back onto feed over the course of a couple of days. So it's really, really critical to keep those feeders full. Uh, they're really simple for those of you guys that have got full-time jobs and you're doing something else and you're trying to do some freezer beef on the side. This may be the only way you can do it, especially in the winter time when we don't have time in the afternoons to go feed because it's gotten dark on us. Uh, my problem that I don't like about a self feeder is it makes it really hard to, to find animals that get sick. Okay. You know, if, if, if you're not out there with them twice a day feeding, you know, you start to get animals that are running some sort of health issue. Uh, it's maybe a little easier to keep a little harder to keep an eye on them with a self feeder. Um, Versus hand feeding, you know, if you've got an animal that gets sick, probably the first thing he's going to do is go off feed. And so if you've got those calves coming up to feed, you're feeding them twice a day, they run up to the bunk and eat, and all of a sudden, you know, tag number 26, he's hanging back from the bunk, maybe he's got a little snotty nose, 
he was pretty to, easy to identify in a hand-fed situation. He's got a health issue that we need to we need to address. Another problem that I've seen with producers using self-fed rations is if you've got cattle that that maybe have a little bit of a uh, they're a little flighty already. Uh, self feeders are not going to make that any better. All right, so you're you're pulling a self feeder out in the pasture. Those animals get zero human contact on a daily basis. They don't recognize a human as a person bringing feed, and so they're going to be fairly skittish. Uh, which can be a problem as we start to get ready to take them to slaughter, uh, making it more stressful to handle them and, and could potentially cause us some uh, quality defects on our carcasses from a, uh, from a stress perspective. When we're hand feeding animals, uh, we're probably looking at wanting to feed at least twice a day. We're still wanting to do truly full feeding, so making sure they're getting, you know, 2% of body weight or better. Uh, but we want to make that, you know, work them up to that very slowly. Uh, if we're dealing with an 800 pound animal, we're starting on feed, maybe we're feeding four pounds per head per day to start with, and then gradually over a couple of weeks, working them up to 16 pounds per head per day. And then eventually, your big thing here is just continue to pour out feed as long as they'll clean it up. Um, probably what you'd want to do is make sure that, that at least once every other day, your feed bunk is, is slick, we would call it very clean, where they've licked the bottom of it up. And as long as they're cleaning the feed up, you can continue to increase your feed uh, supplementation uh, and get them to eat more feed. Now, just like anything we do with livestock, anytime you make dietary changes, make those slowly. Never just abruptly change diets on animals. That is a great way, especially in ruminants, that is a great way to cause bloat, to cause all kinds of dietary problems that can kill animals very quickly and definitely, if nothing else, will slow down their rate of gain and, uh, and, and cause you lots of problems. So if you're changing diets, you know, mix diets together for two or three or four days, uh, you know, make those dietary changes over a 10 to 14 day period, and, uh, and, and you should be in pretty good shape. So a quick example of a, a nutritional management plan we might use for a grain finished animal. This is, you can find this in our Alabama Beef Handbook, or if you go to aces.edu, you can search freezer beef reference guide. And this is, it's the same publication in two places that Dr. Mullenix, our uh, beef system specialist on campus, put together. But but the idea here is if you're, you're raising animals yourself, you'd wean them at maybe five to 600 pounds. Um, we'd want to background them for that first three, two to 300 pounds of weight gain. So feed them commodity feeds of some kind, grazing potentially, targeting a, a two pound a day average daily gain for that first 800 pounds. By doing this, we're going to let that animal put some frame on. They're going to let them get a little older. Uh, and we potentially will have a little bit more efficient gains when we swap them over to full feed. And then once they hit that, 800-pound uh, threshold, we'll swap over to a, you know, an 80% grain, 20% roughage diet until we hit that finished point, okay? And remember, finished is it's not an exact weight for every, it's not the same weight for every animal. Uh, it can have some variation depending on a lot of different things, and we'll, we'll spend a little more time talking about here in a minute. Now, this does not have to be complicated, okay? There are a lot of commercial feed ingredients out there, or feeds that you can use. You, you can put together your own feed ration if you'd like. If you've got a mixer grinder you're just itching to use and you want to put together feed rations, you can do that. If you've got, uh, if you just want to mix them in five gallon buckets, we can help you put together a ration to do that. But for most of us, it's probably easier to let a nutritionist at one of the feed companies or feed mills in our state put together a diet for us and let us just use that diet. And so, what I suggest a lot of, especially first time producers that are doing this to work with your local feed distributor, whether it's the Alabama Farmers Co-op or some other local feed store that you have access to in your area. Um, they'll have a lot of feed products. You may not be able to get the answer you want out of the, the, the sales staff at the store. They may not know as much information about each feed as, as say uh, a nutritionist would at their corporate level. But the co-op, for example, they have nutritionists at their corporate office and they also have uh, feed salesmen around the state know a ton about the feed products they produce. And so now if you're just looking at the feeds that they that some of these companies have available, uh, looking for words like grower feed, developer feed, uh, bull test feed, bull grower feed, those are typically words a lot of these companies use to describe feeds that are high in energy, high in protein, but that they're using to grow animals at a rapid pace. Uh, you're going to want to avoid using feeds that are maybe brood cow feeds. Those are typically maybe going to be fairly high in protein, but the energy content may not be quite as high because uh, they're targeting a, a mature animal that needs, you know, supplementation on grass. 
some of the stocker feeds can kind of be intermittent in the middle. Uh, you know, for stocker operators, we're usually not targeting these, these huge explosive three pound plus gains per day. So some of them will have enough energy, some won't. And the other challenge you're gonna run into is feed tags are not gonna show you the energy content of feed, or they're not gonna have that TDN number on there. So this is what most commercial feed tags are gonna look like. Okay, they're gonna tell you protein, they're gonna tell you crude fat and crude fiber, okay? They're also gonna tell you some ingredients. So like this feed says processed grain byproducts, roughage products, grain products. Uh, and these are just like food ingredient statements that have to be listed by order of inclusion. So the biggest thing in this feed would be processed grain byproducts, which is probably soy holes, if I had to guess. Um, the second largest is a roughage product, which may be cottonseed holes. Uh, and then finally, grain products may be corn. That may be the third largest feed in, ingredient in that feed. Um, the other thing it's going to have is some feeding directions telling you how to feed those cattle. And then um, some explanation of what the goals are for that feed, how it to be used. Now, how can I use this feed tag if it doesn't have energy on it? All I've got is crude protein, crude fat, crude fiber, and I can't call anybody. I can't get any more information than what's on here. How can I tell if this feed's going to be good enough to use to finish cattle? Well, this isn't a, uh, this for sure isn't a, uh, you know, perfect method, but a quick, easy uh, estimation of energy or TDN would be 80% minus the crude fiber listed on the tag. Okay, so let's apply that to the feed we just had above. Crude fiber is 20%. 80% minus 20 is 60% TDN. So this feed, while it is 13% crude protein and would meet the needs from a protein perspective for a, a 900 pound stocker steer that we're trying to finish, it's gonna be lacking in energy. It's not gonna get the job done. And probably by looking at the ingredients, we could have seen that. Uh, if grain products had been the number one ingredient, most grain products can be fairly high in energy and we could have seen that it's probably gonna be a little higher energy feed. But that high fiber on this is, is a pretty dead giveaway. It's not gonna have a, a real high energy content. The other thing that I would suggest you do is find a way to buy feed in bulk. Okay, feed is going to be your business outside of the cost of the animal, which is something you definitely need to take into account. And we'll talk about that some on Friday. You need to know what your animal's worth to start with. The biggest expense you're going to have in finishing these animals is going to be feed. All right. Uh, depending on how big these calves are, when you start them on your feeding, you may use anywhere from 1,500 to 4,500 pounds of feed per animal. Okay, so if we're looking at a feed that's costing us $300 a ton, you know, we could pretty easily wrap up two, you know, three, four, five, six hundred dollars in finishing an animal if we're not careful. Most feed companies will deliver feed to your farm for a three ton minimum, so 6,000 pounds. And you think, well, three tons, three tons is a lot, a lot, excuse me. But if you're finishing an animal, any number of animals, you'll eat three tons of feed. Um, and typically when you can get up to full loads, full 24 ton loads or short truck loads where they can send you 12 to 15 tons at a time, you can start to see some reduced pricing. So um, tried to put together some quick math, but um, I can pretty easily put the math together that says that even if you're only finishing 15 steers, you could feed an entire 24 ton load of feed in a self feeder to 15 steers. So even some of us that are fairly small and not producing a lot of freezer beef, you can you can pretty quickly justify putting up a feed bin and buying feed in bulk. The other question I typically get a lot of is uh, how long am I going to have to feed my calf? And uh, again, that's a, that's a kind of a loaded question. Uh, the data I'm using here to kind of illustrate the point, this is our pasture to rail data. So for those of you that are not familiar with that program, it's our retained ownership program here in the state that I manage along with some other agents. And so what I've done is this is a little over 1,700 calves we've put in feed yard in, in the feed yard in southwest Kansas. And, and how big they are when they start the feeding period, how many days they have to spend on feed to reach a finished weight, and how quickly they grow. And, and basically the take-home point here is the smaller you start these calves on a finishing diet, the longer they're going to have to be on feed, and the, the smaller they're going to be when they finish. Now, there's some caveats in this data. One, they take about 30 days to warm these calves up. So you could probably cut two weeks off of those numbers, cut 14 days off for your animals. Additionally, they, uh, all these calves are implanted and they feed ionophores and they use ractopamine. Uh, but Optiflex is the product, uh, a beta agonist at the end of the feeding period. So the carcass, the, head, the finished weights may be, you know, 50 to 70 pounds heavier than, than what you might have at home. 
but it still drives the point home that if we start a, a 900 pound steer on feed and we push him pretty hard, we probably can get that calf finished in 100, 120 days. But if you take a 500 pound calf straight off the cow and, and try to put him on a finishing ration and, and create a calf that, that's truly finished and truly meets the, the requirements our consumers are looking for, you may have to feed him 150, 160, 170 days or more for that matter. Um, now, again, I think the, the beautiful thing about this, if you're a large producer that's wanting to, uh, to do freezer beef in a small way, you know, this could be a great opportunity for replacement heifers that don't breed. So we keep 10 or 15 replacement females. We expose them to AI or the bull for two services, uh, preg check, and then anybody that's open probably is weighing above 800 pounds or 850 pounds already. They may be fairly fat as it is. You know, we can put them on a high grain diet for maybe even as short as 75 or 80 days, finish them and have them ready as a grass, as a, uh, a grain fed uh, beef ready for, for sale. Okay, so transitioning from, from grain fed over to grass fed, um, I think usually when we think about grass fed, we're typically thinking about a product that's a lot of us think is not very desirable. But what I wanted to highlight is, is that there are some really cool possibilities with grass fed beef. Dr. Chris Kurth was a, a, a meat scientist here at Auburn University in the early 2000s, and he did a ton of research, a set produced a lot of papers and journal articles on, on grass-fed beef production and consumer acceptance of grass-fed beef. But one of the papers I picked out he did was where they fed 30 steers, uh, either 10 of them were on 100% ryegrass, 10 had ryegrass with a grain supplementation, or 10 were on a, a corn-based finishing diet in a dry lot uh, in South Alabama at the Wiregrass Station, I believe. And what they found was that at the end, the ryegrass calves were a little leaner, uh, they had a lower USDA quality grade, or yeah, yield grade, excuse me, but they did not see any differences in quality grade marbling score, okay? So they produced a 1,300 pound choice carcass, or 1,300 pound choice animal uh, that would definitely meet most of our, our target uh, carcass quality measurements. So you can truly finish cattle on grass. It is possible under really specific circumstances. Okay, so this was large calves going on to ryegrass in the spring in Southeast Alabama, okay. Dr. Mullenix, as part of some of her graduate work, did similar projects looking at using warm season annuals in, um, in Alabama to do the same thing. So the cattle were backgrounded on ryegrass in the spring, and then they either finished the animals on cow peas, lab lab, or pearl millet. And you can see the, the graph on the right-hand side there their gains weren't really all that impressive. The calves are only gaining, you know, between a pound and a, and a pound and a third a day during the summer. But if you look at their final body weights, we were still able to get, they were still able to get those steers up uh, to over 1,300 pounds. So we were still producing an animal that, that, that kind of meets the target of what we're looking for in the summer. So it is possible. We can do it. But if you look at most of the research that's out there and, and mostly what happens with grass-fed beef production, that's not the normal, okay? Typically grass-fed carcasses are gonna be a lot leaner. Uh, they're not gonna have quite as much marbling because we don't have as much fat on that animal. Growth is gonna be much slower, like Dr. Molinix's paper uh, showed, which is gonna lead to a smaller carcasses, or if you're gonna have the large carcasses, much more time on feed or much more time grazing. Uh, and then depending on the consumer, that may or may not create a carcass that they really like to eat. You know, it's going to have that grassy flavor. It's not going to have a ton of fat. And, and you know, for the right person, that's very acceptable for most. And maybe, maybe not. So when we start thinking about forage systems uh, to do this, I want to, you know, what are, what are some of the ones that definitely work? For sure, if we want to do grass-fed beef production, how can we make this work? Well, cool season annuals are a no-brainer. Ryegrass, small grains, clovers, uh, this is simple, easy. We can grow them in the entire state of Alabama. Um, you know, you can get 90 plus days grazing on most of these, uh, no matter where you're at in the state. They're very high in energy. They're going to produce really good gains. And so that will work, no question. You're going to have to time the animals up right where they're, you know, seven, 800 pounds, maybe 1,000 pounds before they start. Um, but we can definitely get the calves finished on that cool season annual. 
Warm season annuals can work probably for a fairly short period of time and it's not incredibly reliable. So that picture on the screen is actually a warm season annual plot from a producer up in Marshall County um, that, that does a lot of cool stuff. But crabgrass, millets, the sorghum sudans, lab lab, cow peas, um, there's a lot of different you know high quality annuals out there we can grow during the summer. The problem is you know how how um, how much can we rely on rain in the summer in Alabama, right? So getting these established early in the spring could be a challenge. This year, if you lived in the north half of the state, it's probably fairly challenging. We've had plenty of moisture, but it's been pretty cool. And so you know early growth on our warm season annuals has probably been a little bit depressed. And then definitely as we get late in the season, the quality tanks very quickly. These plants begin to get mature very fast. They lignify. And so we're not going to be able to support the gains we need large with warm season annuals as we get into August, September, uh, early October. Okay. Cool season perennials can work, but it's really specific. I think for the northern part of the state, you can make novel endophyte fescues work through the fall. Orchard grass, maybe in some spots. Orchard grass, we definitely can't count on to be very persistent. I do know of some spots in Jackson County and Marshall County and Lauderdale County, some of the places I used to work that uh, where there's orchard grass growing and it is persistent and it's doing pretty good, but uh, we definitely can't go planting orchard grass all over the world and expect to have really good production. But this is probably fairly limited to the northern part of the state, north of Birmingham. Um, and so putting together a system where you use all three of these is probably what you're gonna have to do. Uh, and even then you're still gonna have fairly seasonal grass-fed beef production limited to the spring, early summer, and maybe fall. Now what might work? Well, baleage might be a product we could use to fill in the gaps. Um, if we're producing really, really high quality, uh, warm, cool season, excuse me, baleage, um, we can definitely get those high 70 plus percent TDN, high protein. Uh, the problems I see with baleage is one, cost. I mean, if you're a small producer, getting the equipment, you know, a $50,000 baler and, and wrapper set up, seven or eight dollars in plastic per bale, um, it can get pretty expensive pretty quickly. Additionally, if you're not able to, uh, to feed that baleage, the whole bale within three days, you're going to start to run into some, some spoilage issues in the wintertime. If we're using baleage to fill in the summer gaps, uh, that might not even last as long. You know, you may, you may need to be able to, to clean up a baleage bale in every, every other day. Um, so if you're not feeding more than, you know, eight or ten grass-fed beef steers or heifers, you might not be putting enough grazing pressure on it to utilize it before you get spoilage. Alfalfa could for sure work. Quality is no question there for grazing alfalfa or cutting alfalfa for hay or baleage. Um, but for most of us, we don't have good enough quality soils. Or if we really are honest with ourselves, we, we don't have the skills it takes or the time it takes to manage alfalfa the way you need to to get um, the utilization out of it that you need to finish calves and keep the persistence up on the alfalfa. In my opinion, alfalfa is, while it's the, the queen of forages for us, um, it, it definitely needs to be treated as such. It, it takes perfect management on pretty perfect ground to make alfalfa work. We might could make some really intensely managed warm season perennials work for a short period early in the season. So Bermuda grass grazed every three to four weeks religiously, um, maybe through June, you know, could pre present enough quality that, that you could get some calves to gain fairly quickly on it. But as you start to get deeper in the season, those are gonna to be tough too. And Bahia grass may never produce quality high enough to make that work. And then some systems that are for sure not gonna work, again, warm season perennials that are under uh, continuous grazing. You can't turn calves out on Bahia grass pasture or Bermuda grass pasture and just let them run all summer and expect them to gain weight. And for sure you can't expect them to gain enough weight to be considered grass finished, okay? For those of us in the north part of the state, Kentucky 31, not gonna, not going to be an option. Brood cows can handle that toxic end of fight fairly well, but the growing calves are they're not going to grow like we need them to. Here's some some data from our uh, hay testing lab on campus, soil testing lab that, that kind of drives the point home of of what we see from a quality perspective on average from some of these grasses, um, Bahia grass, Bermuda grass, and most of our tall fescues. They're just not going to have the energy we need um, to really produce uh, the gains we need to get these animals to grow and finish. All right, some other quick considerations for cattle, and I'm, I'm running a tick behind, so I want to catch up and move a little quicker. Um, 
breed types. I don't want to make anybody mad. And, and I know that, that there are definitely outliers in every breed. You know, every breed has got one animal that, that breaks the mold. But some general considerations when we think about breeds, dairy breeds are not going to be nearly as heavy muscled. Um, they are typically going to be a little bit, maybe a little higher marbling on average. Uh, Holsteins will get really, really, really big. So, so starting them on feed young and trying to get them to fatten fairly quickly. Uh, would be important. Jerseys are, are never going to get very big uh, and are definitely never going to produce you a very high yielding carcass that's going to give you a lot of meat, but it could produce some quality and those animals are very cheap to purchase if you can find them. Wagyu, I think anybody that's doing um, freezer beef has, has entertained the thought of utilizing Wagyu genetics. It definitely comes with a ready-made marketing plan. Everybody knows that that name, or at least anybody that's interested in purchasing expensive beef kind of knows what that is. Uh, my experience with the Wagyu's around the state has been that there is a tremendous variation in quality. Okay, the really good Wagyu's are wonderful. They, they actually grow a little, they do have some muscle, and they, they do put a really nice um, addition marbling into that carcass. The average to below average Wagyu genetics running around are just not very good. And so, you know, you kind of get what you pay for when you start dealing with some of these, these different breeds. And then, you know, anytime we're dealing with breeds that are outside the normal, there's a reason they're outside the normal, okay? You know, Longhorns, Brahmin influenced cattle probably are not going to marble quite as well as we would like to see some of our traditional beef breeds will. Not saying they won't marble at all, um, but, but they probably are not going to do it to quite the extent that our, our normal beef breeds would. Uh, if we're dealing with small frame cattle or minis, you know, they're going to fatten very quickly. We're going to give us smaller cuts, which might be desirable, but uh, they're, you know, they, they're not going to produce a, a very typical sized carcass. There are some very real differences in sex. Heifers tend to be fatter. They tend to be a little smaller. They tend to marble a little bit better, um, but they're also a little less feed efficient. Heifers might fit into a grass-fed beef production system fairly well, uh, outside of the fact that if you turn a bull in there with them, they may get pregnant, um, where steers are, are the exact opposite, obviously, the heifers there. And then there are some production practices you're gonna to wanna to think about, uh, and I'm not discouraging you from using any of these. Matter of fact, I think you all already have something, a, a marketing um, plan that, that nobody else has, and that's that you're local. Okay, local sells. Somebody knows the farmer that's producing their product and trusts the farmer that they're working with. So, you know, I think you, could, you can use implants and ionophores, um, and, and as long as you can explain the, the value in those, what they're doing, why we're using them, why they're important. You know, with the implants, we're more efficient. We're using our resources better. We're producing more beef with less animals. Ionophores, we're, yes, we're feeding an antibiotic, but we're more efficient. We're protecting ourselves against coccidia and bloat, different things. Um, and I, now this is, this is somewhat personal preference for me, but also what I consider a BQA principle. Uh, there's no excuse for not using antibiotics when they're needed. Uh, the last thing I ever want to see is one of a producer in our state or anywhere for that matter that ref does not treat an animal that needs antibiotics, doesn't treat the animal because they're trying to preserve an all natural label. Okay. I don't, if you're all natural or not, if you're trying to go antibiotic free, that's fine. Um, but you need to use antibiotics if they're needed. Okay. Don't let an animal suffer because you want a consumer to buy your product for 50 cents a pound more. Okay. That's, that, that's not right, and it's an animal, animal welfare issue, and, and that's not good for anybody if we do things like that. And then finally for cattle, the last point is age is a big deal, okay? So um, we want to try and get our animals to slaughter under 30 months of age if possible, okay? This would be what we consider a maturity score A animal. They're young, they're tender, uh, and, but the biggest part of that is we don't have any sort of restrictions or carcass issues we have to deal with. Cattle that go over 30 months of age are at considered higher risk for bovine spongiform and sepalothopy or mad cow, right? So we have some what are called specific risk materials or specified risk materials that have to be removed from those carcasses. Basically, any of the central nervous system tissue has to be removed. So the head, all the spinal column, and all of the, uh, the nerves running off the spinal column have to be cut out. So you're not getting T-bone steaks out of an animal over 30 months of age, okay, because the spinal column's gone. This can really be a challenge when we start thinking about grass-finished animals. Okay, we can produce grass-finished animals, but sometimes they're gonna be a good bit older, right? So some calves I've seen that are really nice and finished and look good purely on grass, typically you're bumping up into that 24, 25, 26 month of age range, maybe a little higher than that. 
So we want to make sure we get those animals processed under 30 if we can. All right, so transitioning from cattle to swine and, and the swine side of this, I'm gonna move fairly quickly um, and, and that way we can have some time for questions. Basically what I'm presenting to you guys is what I use for my, uh, my 4-H meetings. We have a 4-H project called Project Pig Squeal where our 4-Hers get two barrows in the spring and they raise them for 120 days and bring them back as finished market hogs. And so um, I, if, an, if, if our 4-Hers can handle it, all of our producers in the state should be able to raise pigs and do a really good job. And, and our 4 hers do a fantastic job raising, um, raising these market hogs. So it's important to remember that pigs are really different than our ruminant counterparts we're dealing with. And, and good housing is very important, especially if we're gonna deal with these white pigs, York, uh, the York cross pigs, white line crosses, they get sunburned, I mean, just like we do. So they need to be able to have shade throughout the day, at least one wall as a windbreak somewhere. If we're gonna be feeding these animals through the winter, three walls with the opening facing south is kind of ideal so we can get some daylight in there to dry the floor out, keep it fairly warm. Um, contrary to popular belief, keeping these animals clean is really important. They don't need a place to go wallow in the mud, all right? All we're doing by allowing them to spend time in the mud is we allow them around disease, and we allow them to be in, in, in an environment that's gonna slow down their growth. So you may wanna do that. You may wanna provide them a lot of room and, and some mud and a place to run around because that's part of your marketing plan and you wanna show your consumers that you're, you're giving these animals the run of the world like they're a wild pig. But from a production standpoint, you know, keeping them in a fairly confined environment and clean is really important. So if we're running these pigs on concrete, we can use as little as eight, 10 square feet per pig, concrete or slats. Um, if we're gonna use a wood floor, like the picture that you see there, that's one of our 4 H'ers from up in Northwest Alabama we work with. Um, you know, maybe you need to be more like 12 to 14 square feet for, per pig. Here's an example of, of one of our kids that I work with up there that um, their family had a dog kennel where they used to raise, I think it was coon hounds or something, but they tore the wall out between two of the runs and raised two pigs in there and it worked fantastic. Those pigs grew really well, they performed really well, they were really clean, healthy, and did fantastic. Now as we start thinking about feeding pigs, again, just like cattle, there's two ways to do this. You can hand feed them um, where you're feeding at least twice a day. My problem with hand feeding is, is pigs are really bad about, you know, the, the little pig's gonna get pushed away. So if you're running more than two or three pigs in a pen, um, you know, we're gonna have a challenge there with competition at feeding. You're gonna have one pig that eats more than everybody else. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I usually try and get our 4 hers to do full feed or a self feeder. Uh, none of, you're not gonna have any trouble with uh, dom, you know, dominant pigs keeping other pigs away. He's gotta sleep at some point uh, and it's gonna let those smaller pigs come eat. Now I still need to check on the feeder every day. It's not an excuse for not going and checking on the pigs. Um, but, but this would be the preferred method for raising pigs. Now, feeding on pigs is incredibly complicated. But for us, it can be incredibly simple. So pigs have a digestive system very similar to ours. They're monogastric, they have a simple stomach. Um, and so their nutrient requirements are very different than that of, of cow, sheep, or goat. Um, they have a higher protein and energy requirement to get the growth we need, all that sort of stuff. So what I typically tell our 4 hers and anyone else I talk to that's interested in raising pigs is use a commercially mixed grower feed. Don't try to mix your own ration. It's not worth it. Um, there are really good nutritionists all over the country that are really smart and really know what they're doing. They're putting these grower rations together that can get these pigs to grow and perform. There's no need in trying to use your own feed, feed rations that you can make at home. Okay, um, You're either going to overfeed protein to get the lysine that they need. There's all kinds of issues you can run into. I just it's better to use a commercially mixed ration uh, because of the fact that they're the monogastric. Some of the feed ingredients we might use could cause some off flavors. Um, during the last couple of weeks of their life, if they're starting to get fairly fat, but you're not quite ready for the slaughter, for, they're not quite made their, um, their slaughter date yet, you may need to move them over to a finisher ration uh, that, that maybe is a little less energy and can, can slow down the fat deposition to keep them fairly lean. Um, if you're gonna mix your own feed, there are some commercial blends that you can mix, protein blends that you mix with corn, you know, mix it 
two parts corn to one part commercial blend, whatever it specifies that can work. Um, but the big thing I've seen a lot of our 4-Hers do every year, and I, I highly encourage you guys, if, you, if you're not raising your own pigs, but you'd like some freezer pork, come to one of our pig squeal shows and auctions we have every spring. They're usually about this time of year um, and buy one of these pigs. But every year, if you come to one of those auctions, there's always at least one family at every auction that didn't listen and they tried to feed their pig nothing but whole shell corn or whole crack corn or sweet feed. And that doesn't meet their energy requirements. And where the exact same age pigs are weighing 275, 280, 300 pounds, those pigs are weighing 160, 170. They're lean, uh, they're not very heavily muscled, they're definitely underweight. The other thing that I see on the internet regularly, very regularly, is people grazing pigs. Pigs are not rumens. Now, I'm not saying they can't eat grass and clover and eat some of those things and you utilize them, but it's definitely not very efficient or very effective. Okay. They need feed that's not, I mean, it would be no different than you going out there and grazing grass and clover and trying to gain weight. Okay. It's not going to happen. So if you're wanting to finish a pig and, and do it in a timely fashion and not spend a year trying to finish one, but get him fed in, in four months, Use a commercially mixed ration. It's a fairly simple process. You're going to use eight to 1,400 pounds of feed per pig and get them up to weighing close to 300 pounds by doing that. Here are some examples of what those self feeders might look like. The other thing that's pretty important on pigs is water. Um, open top waters don't work well for pigs. They love to play in it and spill it, and you're going to be fixing water every day. Uh, these nipple drinkers are a much better option for pigs. The other issue with these, though, is either they need to be mounted where they'll move or they kind of hang and, and swing out in the middle of the pen, or above their back, pigs are pretty bad about it. they'll scratch on them, get them dirty, or potentially uh, cause rectal prolapses by scratching and, and, and causing damage there as well. So some, some general expectations for pigs. Um, if you're starting with a 50 pound feeder pig, if you do a good job from a nutritional standpoint, he'll reach market weight in, in four to five months fairly quickly. Never feed boars. If you're gonna feed these pigs, make sure they're castrated. Okay, boars, um, as they reach puberty and maturity, produce a hormone that causes a, a flavor issue in their meat called boar taint. It is very strong, very pungent. And when we do harvest boars, they're typically harvested with 10, 15, 20 sows, and that meat is mixed in and ground into a highly seasoned sausage product to try and mask the flavor. It's very, very pungent. You do not want to do that if you can avoid it. And again, there are some pretty significant breed differences. Here on campus, we have woolly pigs or the mangalitsas. Um, a lot of these high-end restaurants and, and foodie type folks are, see that as kind of the, the, the pig version of the Wagyu cattle. Uh, Berkshires might also fit that description. Mangalitsa is a little different than Berkshires. They're gonna be really fat. Uh, the ones we harvest here on campus, when they reach 300 pounds, they're, they've got two and a half, three inches of back fat. I mean, they're like, they're like old school lard pigs. You know, our York, white line cross, maternal lines, those are really good pigs that work really well. They may not be quite as heavily muscled and a little fatter carcasses, but, but they do a good job. And then if you, you end up using some Duroc or Hamp lines, these terminally bred pigs, Piatrins, stuff like that, they're gonna make really heavy muscle, big hams, big, big lean pigs. Uh, they're gonna be very similar to what you'd expect if you went to the local grocery store and picked up um, pork. So some kind of final thoughts as we're thinking about, we've done all this work, we've raised these animals, we've got them to a point that's truly considered finished, and now we need to deliver them to the processor. Well, number one, call your processor well in advance. Um, even in normal, day, normal times, processors are usually three to four months booked out. I mean, not, not in the craziness we're dealing with right now. Um, right now, you may be in some places seven, eight months away from getting an animal slaughtered if you call today. Uh, a friend of mine in South Alabama called her processor and she booked a calf to go to the processor in February of 2021. Okay, if you've got a calf that weighs 1,300 pounds today and you haven't talked to a processor yet, I hope you know how to kill them at home because you're probably not going to find a good avenue to get that animal processed very quickly. But make sure you communicate with them um, well in advance. When we're moving these animals to slaughter, use as low stress handling as we possibly can. Be quiet. Uh, the last thing we want to do is stress these animals out right just prior to slaughter. Uh, with pigs, you know, we can cause some very significant meat quality issues with short-term stress prior to slaughter. PSE, it's called, or pale soft and exudative meat. Uh, our cattle, if we stress them 
for two or three days prior, they have some uh, real heavy stress the day prior. We can cause dark cutting beef carcasses, which are um, uh, definitely an issue for our consumers. This is key. As someone who has worked in a meat processing facility a pretty good bit and a small one here on campus, make sure you withhold feed for 18 to 24 hours prior to when they're slaughtered, especially on the cattle, but pigs too. Um, that calf, uh, he's got a full rumen. If you've let him eat and, and fill up right before he goes to meet the processor, that rumen's really hard to get out of there without busting it or causing some problems. And it's, it makes the headache on the processor. And if they happen to bust that rumen, uh, all of a sudden now we've lost 20 or 30 pounds of carcass because everything that that rumen fluid and digestive touch just trimmed off. All your briskets are gone, your skirt steak's gone, shanks are probably gone um, because we've had to trim it off and throw it away to, to reduce our food safety risk. Check your withdrawal times. Anytime, we're, anytime you're dealing with animals and you give an antibiotic or a vaccine or any animal health product, you need to make sure you, you use the withdrawal times. Uh, but especially on these market ready animals, we wanna make sure we, we've got those taken care of and make sure your animals are healthy. Uh, the calf that's pictured here, that's not what we wanna see showing up to a processor, skinny, thin, double snotty noses. Um, kind of like our BQA principle is, uh, would you eat what you sell? Would you eat that animal when you deliver it to the processor? That's the question you need to ask yourself. And then finally, make sure you're very, very, very clear on ownership. Uh, when the animal is delivered to the processor. If you're using a custom plant, for example, that animal has to be sold on a live weight basis before it's delivered to the processor, okay? Um, but if you're selling cuts of meat, whatever you're doing, when that animal gets dropped off, make sure that the, that the processor knows who's he, who he belongs to and who's gonna come picking it up and who's gonna pay the bill, okay? We don't wanna run into any of those problems while that animal is hanging out at the processor at a third party location. So finally, some conclusions. Um, again, I think we've got a tremendous opportunity right now as producers to, to take advantage and, and bring some new uh, consumers to eating locally produced meats. Um, but make sure you understand what your consumer's looking for. Make sure you know what they want and that the product you're producing meets those needs if you wanna meet them. Uh, make sure you're, you're working with your animals to produce a truly finished animal it's going to create a good product that our uh, consumers are going to desire. And then make sure when it arrives at harvest that it's in the best possible condition it can be in uh, and that you've done everything in your power to make sure that product uh, is wholesome and safe for the consumer. So with that, I'd love to take any questions you guys have. There's my cell phone number and email address. Please feel free to give me a call if you've got any questions. Um, again, remember, we'll take questions now, but if, uh, um, if you have time, Dr. Sawyer is going to be presenting the, the processing side of this equation on Wednesday at noon, and then Ellie Watson from Sweet Corn Alabama and myself on Friday are going to do an hour about um, marketing, uh, pricing, and some of the, the considerations after you've got a product in hand and you're trying to get paid for it. So with that, love to take any questions anybody might have. Hey, Mr. Alex, Ryan, can you hear me? Sure, yes, sir, sure can. Uh, so I just, just this morning dropped off um, four steers up at um, Reeds and Clanton. Okay. And um, so to my surprise, they, um, the earliest date, if you call right now, the earliest date they have is August of 2021. So wow. 14 months out, um, I guess is where they they booked up to. But I was um, curious as to if you knew of any other processors. I'm I'm south. I'm, I'm about 30 miles south of Montgomery. Um, but I was wondering if you could recommend any any other processors, kind of yeah. in the state that would. I I call Cav and. Um, so like the, the boys I took up today were 18, 19 months old. Um, and I, I really don't want to be trying to finish the ones for next year, you know, in May and June. Um, sure. So I'd like to find processing dates that are about this time next year. But That's a great question. And it's one we all deal with. We're dealing with pretty heavily right now. Um, what I would tell you is that Allie and myself and a couple other folks have been working, especially Allie's been working really hard 
to put together a list of all the processors in Alabama with their contact information and several processors that are all right on the line in Georgia, Florida, Mississippi, and Tennessee. And I don't think they quite have that ready, but hopefully within the next week, probably, or two weeks, Allie, um, they're going to have that published on the Cattleman's website. Um, okay. and, and hopefully she can answer that question better than I can. Yes. So I've been working on that personally at my office, trying to get all that contact information and being sure that those processing plants want to be on our website. Because some processing plants, they've got all that they want to do. Mm -hmm. So we're making sure that we cover all our bases there and we'll upload that to our website. We're also putting a directory for freezer beef. So if any of you on this Zoom today um, want your information to be on there for people to contact you to get freezer beef from you yourself, please fill that out. It's on the same link that you all use to register today, um, but that will be uploaded as well within, within the next week or two. Okay. Uh, and then one more question. I was curious if you could kind of throw an average out there of what you're seeing um, producers charging for freezer beef or what, you know. You That's a great question. And, and, and we're going to address that pretty heavily on Friday. Um, okay. but, but, you know, just throwing some quick numbers out there. Um, anywhere from two dollars to three dollars a pound hanging weight i've seen a lot of people using so that would equate to you know a dollar forty to a dollar thirty forty to two and a quarter live weight something like that okay um, but but again we'll get into some details on friday on how you can kind of calculate exactly what you might need to charge or mm -hmm. you know if you want to go look at the retail counter and, and back kind of back calculate uh, well, ground beef costs this much. What maybe should I be charging for my beef? That's we're, that's probably going to be about fifteen or twenty minutes of what we talk about on Friday during this this uh, session. So, okay. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Or Allie, did you have any questions come in over the chat? Um, I only had one question, and I I answered it. it was just about what when this will be uploaded for future viewing. But I think that's it in the chat box, unless anybody else. Ha well, actually, one. So we just had a new one pop up in the chat box. I've got it pulled up too. Okay. Um, good. So the question is about feed testing. Uh, where can I get a TDN on hay? Yes, you can definitely send that in to the Souls Lab at Auburn. So if you're gonna, if you're trying to take, uh, and I, I, I should have mentioned this. I feel like a terrible extension agent for not talking about this in my presentation. Um, yes, if you've got hay you're utilizing, take a soil t or a hay test. Excuse me. Um, so for each batch of hay, you're going to want to pull 10 to 15 samples from, from 10 or 15 different bales that were harvested in the same field at the same time. Um, mix those, put them in a Ziploc bag, send them into Auburn with uh, one of our hay testing forms. I believe our general uh, hay test is $15, I think. That'll give you a crude protein, uh, TDN, and uh, some of the fiber fractions. Uh, if you were concerned about nitrates, I believe our nitrate testing is an additional $6 on top of that. At least it used to be. I need to go update and get make sure I'm squared away on that. Um, there's lots of places you can do that, though. I mean, far, farmers co-ops can do that testing for you as well. Um, you can send it to the University of Georgia if you're not in Alabama. Um, we, we would like for you to send it to Auburn, obviously. But um, you can also do that with your feedstuffs. So if you're purchasing feed, you have a feed locked down and you think it's going to work really good, but you really want to know exactly how good it is, uh, you can take a sample of your feed, send it into our soil testing lab, and uh, we can do an analysis on that feed to tell you the protein and energy content of feeds as well. So um, there's lots of ways that you can really dial that in um, to, to get it exactly right. Yes, and the next question is, if we aren't in the state, can we mail it into the Auburn lab? Yes, you certainly can. Um, I would just to be a good corporate citizen. Uh, if if uh, I would check with your local um, land grant university in your state and see what they have for testing capability. Not every state has a testing lab. I know Georgia does, um, but I know some of our other bordering states do not. So let's say you're in Georgia. Um, you can send it to the Auburn lab if you'd like, but UGA has a lab too. Uh, if you're in Mississippi, I don't think Mississippi State has a testing lab. 
So you would either have to choose Georgia or Auburn or one of the third party labs like Waters or Dairy One. Uh, there's several different testing uh, labs out there you can use to test the, the quality of the feedstuffs you're using. But great question, very good questions. What other, uh, any other questions out there? Well, if not, uh, we really appreciate you guys all getting on here. I think at one point I saw we had almost 60 people logged on, which is which really exciting. And there's a lot of extension people in that. But um, again, this is going to be posted on the Cattlemen's website here in the next few days and on their YouTube channel. Um, if you have questions about anything we've talked about so far, again, my contact information is on the screen. Feel free to call me, email me, text me. Um, or get a hold of uh, Allie or anybody at the Cattlemen's Association and they can direct you in the right direction to answer your questions. Um, but with that, I think, uh, I think that's all we have. Again, make sure to tune in on Wednesday at noon for the second part of our deal. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Alex.